And so we wanted to create a, a panel of artists activists to uh, see what the border of this is. I'll just say very briefly, you know, the, the riot and riotous excursions, uh, when we were, Sanaz, the co-curator and I were talking about this, really evoked for us uh, something like the Stonewall Uprising of 1969, as well as some of the work in the late 60s um, done by the Black Panthers, the Gay Liberation Front, and other movements. And we thought, you know, some of these paradigms of the late 60s and this relationship between art and activism are still current, still valuable touchstones, models maybe even to follow, and some paradigms or tactics, strategies, ways of thinking may need to get completely thought through and have so been thought through by very many people. So it's a real privilege to have this little experiment um, in programming for the festival, but I'm, I'm thrilled for this panel, thrilled that you're here, and I'll turn it over to Manteo, who is the moderator of this event. Thank you. Let's gather in a circle. So if you could all come in here. Um, there is video, we want to share it later on, so even though we can speak and hear each other without these mics, we'll do it for the rest of people. But yes, let's gather. So many beautiful seats over there. Yes, thank you. Hi. Testing. Come on in. Let's stand. Let's breathe. Let's make this a call to action. I would like each of us to go around. We're small enough that we can do this. If you can say your name, and if you would like to, add your pronoun, so that we know who's in the room, and we know how we can stand accountable to each other, and hold each other up as we hear the incredible work that these three are able to share with us, to inspire us on, and to receive all that you are bringing into this room right now for our sake as well. So, may Anne, she and they. Anna, she, her. Patrick, he, his. Michael, he, him, his. Patrick, he, him. Tavio, he, him. Frank and Shkou. Shen Shen Ho. Gio Geller, we. Melissa. Rich. Kathleen, she, her. Um, David, he, him. Uh, Jasmine, she, her. Guy, he, him. Cat like meow, she <laughs> 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 I'm fluid. Jabari, he Thank you, let's sit together. Um, last night I found myself at the Park Avenue Armory sitting at the uh, feet of Satoshi Miyagi's Antigone. And there was some text that I felt rang so true um, that I thought that in the lineage of great literature and theater, globally we could bring into the room. Ishmini says, but oh Antigone, think how much more terrible than these our own death would be if we should go against Creon and do what he has forbidden. We are only women, we cannot fight with men, Antigone. The law is strong. We must give in to the law in this thing and in worse. I beg the dead to forgive me, but I am helpless. I must yield to those in authority, and I think it is dangerous business to always be meddling. Antigone responds, if that is what you think, I should not want you, even if you ask to come. You have made your choice. You can be what you want to be, but I will bury him, and if I must die, I say that this crime is holy. I shall lie down with him in death, and I shall be as dear to him as he to me. Um, I'm so grateful to be here with these three who actively put their bodies, their full bodies and spirits in the line of fire, who commit holy crimes. Um, and I wanted to open up by allowing them to have the space to share like what their work is in this time and age that we are in. Would you like to start? Um, sure, so hi everybody. Um, again, my name is Jabari, Jabari Brisbord, he, him, and um, I came into activism through the arts. Uh, actually, I think one of the first uh, 
pieces I, I created when I, um, that I was very proud of was a spoken word about gay marriage um, back when state after state was just saying that it was going to be illegal. It was very personal to me, and I had a chance to uh, go back and perform it at my high school. Um, and like, you know, and I encourage other people to like talk about their experiences as well. Um, but mo most recently, I, um, I've shifted away from the arts. I'm actually a public school teacher now in, in Crown Heights. I teach math at a middle school uh, on North Street Avenue. And I'm also a politician, well, um, activist into intellectual politics. I ran for office in 2017 uh, for city council. And actually, I got, I got arrested um, protesting for uh, housing, which would be like my act of civil disobedience, my, my holy crime. Uh, there was this, uh, this really nasty housing development happening in Crown Heights called the Bedford Union Armory Project. And it was like a full citywide block that had been an armory, like a place where you store like arms and weapons and stuff, but was like empty. And the city was like, what are we going to do with it? And this developer called BFC Partners came in wanting to um, convert it into luxury condos and like um, really expensive, fancy apartments with like a few, like a nice gymnasium for the community and like, you know, some fancy, um, a few like nonprofits come in there. But people were, were up in arms because of the condos. This was a neighborhood in like the middle of Crown Heights where people are getting evicted left and right because the rents are just going skyrocket. Gentrification is like, the crest of it is right in that neighborhood. And so we were protesting, we were protesting the city project and um, I actually got detained once then arrested later. So I got detained at this, at this one meeting where they were, there's like five stages in like, you know, rezoning a, a, um, a lot. And there was one at the um, C city plan, the CPC, the City Planning Commission. So we were protesting, just shouting for them to vote no. Um, me and my friend got pulled away, detained to the side by the cops, handcuffed, um, questioned, but not actually brought to jail. Uh, and then about a week later, we were protesting, and we were just blocking the street. Um, and we got we got hauled in, we got hauled in the van. And what one of the funniest and well, most interesting takeaways for me from that time was that while we were you know, in the holding cells, um, a lot of the cops in the jail were asking us, what, so what were you protesting exactly? Like, why, why were you in the streets? And we were telling them about the army project, and they were like, yeah, man, it's like housing is all about money. Like, yeah, that's really sucks. It's all about business. <coughs> and then on the way out, they were told us, well, we hope you win. Like, after, <laughs> after like, locking us up, they were like, well, we hope you win. Um, that really sounds like a terrible deal. Um, yeah, let me stop there. <laughs> Um, I'm Savitri, and thank you for inviting me here today. Thank you all for coming. Um, I direct Reverend Billy and the Stop Shopping Choir, which is a radical performance community here in New York City of about 50 people. Uh, we've been working maybe 20 years, I guess, in New York on a wide range of issues. We began uh, resisting consumerism in the broadest sense. They're at the tail end of the anti-globalization movement. Uh, that swiftly turns into like an anti-gentrification movement, uh, protecting neighborhoods, small shops. Um, and then, of course, 2001, uh, September 11th, uh, totally changes the game for activists in New York City, militarized police, a uh, very changed street life. Um, and then, of course, the continuation of that gentrification and that kind of what Naomi Klein calls disaster capitalism right here in our city. Uh, which we are living still in the midst of um, as the gentrification radiates away from Manhattan into places like East New York, Crown Heights. Um, so our work for about 10 years was really just holding the street. It was really about just being theatrical on the street, being the last people who could be out there. I would say around 2004, uh, we were just getting our asses kicked by the police pretty often. Um, some of you might remember the, the last big anti-war movement um, protest in 2003, resisting the Iraqi war, when there was you know, maybe six million people protesting around the world, and it was just called a focus group. And to me, that was sort of the death knell of protest as we knew it. Um, and you saw people holding it down for a long time. Occupy Wall Street comes along into the sort of rift of the 2008-2009 recession. There was a little breathing space. Activists could work again. Um, and Occupy, you know, some would say sort of balkanized the protest movement. Some would say it atomized the protest movement. I think there's good and bad there, but it definitely blew it up. It blew it apart. And I think finally, in a very positive way, it made a lot of space uh, in the few years following when uh, Black Lives Matter emerges, Standing Rock, 
um, this incredible uh, change in the culture, making space for leadership, long, long overdue leadership in, in, in visible ways um, for people of color, for movements of color, for indigenous women, um, leading now to what I see right now is this just incredible moment in protest when indigenous women, women of color, uh, immigrant-led movements are happening, emerging. We don't always see these stories. We don't know what they are, but they are happening. And um, I, feel, I feel lucky to live at a time when that is really happening. Um, I hope we can keep the fan beating that fire so it burns brighter and brighter. Um, but yeah, I also came from the arts, and um, I, I don't, the intersection of arts and activism is a, a dangerous one, sometimes uh, precarious for both sides, but um, I'm happy we can talk about it today. Hi, uh, I'm Kat. Um, I'm a freelance theater maker, I said theater maker, performance maker, culture shaker, story shaper kind of thing. I often work as a dramaturg, um, in and with community, uh, performer, director, etc. cetera. Um, uh, what are some of the things that we could talk about today? Um, I think the idea of infiltration, the artistic impulse to respond to moments of crises um, direct, direct action, um, whether or not an artistic impulse can fit within that. Um, and yeah, I'm just gonna keep it short, simple, and cute. Um, and I'm new to New York. Um, I'm from New Orleans originally. Uh, my dad is from Nicaragua. My mom is a Cajun lady from Southwest Louisiana. Um, and I've kind of been all over the place um, in terms of my training and working and et cetera. Um, but I moved to New York in, well, I just made my one year anniversary, actually. Yeah, living in Queens, off like Eddie Murphy and coming to America. Um, yeah, hit me. Thank you. I, I think that what you're talking about already in terms of the artistic impulse within activism and that precarious border you said, or that precarious thing of like, how do we move between these two? Like, let's go right into that. Like, how do you think about activism and art and how do you think about the artistic impulse here and, and, and there and what feeds the other, what stops the other? Um, you talk more about that. Um, so I guess I, I should say, primarily I work with um, and alongside undocumented people, um, migrants um, recently, um, asylum seekers. Um, and uh, just, uh, just as a way of um, example of, of just diving into the deep end, um, of course, I, I would like to think we all know what's happening at our border, um, not just our, our border, but many borders, um, the militarization of the border, et cetera, et cetera, which you know, lives in a long, long history. Um, and I was part of an email chain, um, or actually was part of that chain and then it independently was forwarded to me. Um, somebody wanting to respond, you know, to, to, to make a piece, right, at uh, a detention center and trying to get people together to respond um, to this crisis and, you know. And I think what's, what's so precarious about this wanting to respond, having an impulse to respond, having, having um, a desire uh, to do something uh, is that it places um, the fulfillment of that need, right, in, in oneself. Mm. Um, and so often the most impactful thing is the smallest thing. I think so often people are rattled out of their own experience, right? It's when we, we are confronted with something that makes us realize what we are living within that is invisible to us, the amount of privileges that we have. Um, that's when we feel like we need to do something. We need to do something. And so often, I think, folks become incurious about the experiences of others and are really leading from what they see from their own experience as the need. Where if you ask somebody within you know, that experience that you're um, wanting, right, desiring to serve, to uplift, um, it's, so often it's like the smallest, smallest thing. Um, volunteering, you know, donating clothes, 
um, child care, yeah. Um, and, and so like making the noise, right, um, is I think very often um, self-serving. <laughs> and we like to think that we're making an impact. Now we might be making an impact in our, in our community, right? And of course, you know, these folks um, are a part of our community, um, but so often the impact stays closer to our homes. Um, that's what I'll say about that. Can I like, I just riff off of that? Cause like, I just think that's like so important to talk about the, uh, the worry of it just like becoming like on us. And I know that like, you know, as an artist, like you wanna make something that's very cathartic for your audience, right? You want them to go through an experience, but then you always win the risk of like, you know, if it's, if it's so cathartic that they just like, at the end they're like, phew, okay, I, I went through that. <laughs> um, and don't continue to ask questions. Um, it is important that we do like rile people up and like, you know, like make them feel activated in a way. Did you wanna um, talk about the, that artistic impulse and activism and how you approach that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the question is who's the art for? I mean, it's a pretty basic question that any artist is always asking themselves. And then when you introduce a sort of justice <laughs> uh, or social justice or any kind of justice into it, it changes it because I think, you know, I mean, my mom used to always say that freedom, freedom is when you can live your values, right? When your actions are integrated with your values, that's when you know you're free, right? So as artists, like, uh, well, I think sometimes we don't expand our values very far, right? We keep them inside of an aesthetic principles too long or we shelter them inside of our, our industry, our commerce, our careers, and um, yeah, we forget this other piece of it, which is who is it acting on and who is it really for? You know, I think in New York, like the immigrant question is really interesting because a lot of times we're sending signals, right? We don't know who's receiving the signals in New York. So when we make creative work around migration and immigration in New York, there's this interesting thing, which is that, you know, as many as a million undocumented people might encounter it. And you're sending a signal that you care about them, even if they're not the direct recipient of your work, right? So, I mean, there's interesting layers um, in your audience in a place like New York. I think the difficult thing is that you have to figure out how to make things work on multi so many levels, right? It has to work for your art artistic life, and it has to work sort of in a credible sense for a journalist, or it has to work inside the rubric of like, uh, you know, legitimate social justice movement building and organizing. I mean, it's, it's a lot to ask, really. I mean, I think our work, though, can always be, not though, but our work should always be, you know, engaging and reflective and pushing um, the, the conversation, whatever community it's in for what have you. I think so often um, there is, uh, I know I'm, I'm talking kind of in, in like vague booking, vague, vague book live. Um, uh, but I think often there's like, oh, well, we have to make a piece about X, you know, or it has to be, you know, about Y. And there's, this is the way that like, fuck my hair, I'm pulling my own hair out with my ring, sorry. Um, who doesn't love a, hood, a good hot mess? Um, <laughs> um, but so often, right, this is, this is how like, you know, stories get um, essentialized. Mm -hmm. So that um, a story about immigration has to become about, you know, family separation and, you know, look at these, it's, it becomes trauma porn or, a, you know, a, a, a gay story has to become about like coming out, you know, whatever. And it's, it's totally essentializing and totally dehumanizing, um, actually. Um, and I think that no matter, no matter, no matter, no matter, no matter what the content, the form, the, the creators, um, you know, whoever they are, whatever it is, um, that there is, an, all, there is always an opportunity um, to be really sharp and rigorous in our thought. And so often um, the art that is about X or Y is actually, like it's signaling that it's, that it's deeply engaged, but it's so often the, the most surface level, um, I would say. And, and that's why I think it's so incredibly important if we're gonna have this conversation about activism in the arts and civil disobedience, et cetera, that really I think the, the most important thing that any artist, or any you know, person who wants to engage in a meaningful way in, this t in these kinds of you know, topics is to be um, a participant, um, which is why I started by you know, like the little things like yes, healthcare and, and childcare and you know, volunteering. Um, but that, that for me, that is what influences 
my art making. That's not to say that every single piece that I do is about you know, um, un, you know, X topic of being undocumented, but through my work alongside people, you know, I, my, my, um, my critical acumen gets sharpened, 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 and it's about also being in a place um, of, you know, um, distrusting oneself too, right? Because, you know, all of us have our blind spots, um, and this kind of work is what's going to, to make them visible, I think, to us. I'm really glad that you brought up trauma porn, and I find it really interesting because when we look up what you've done, we see you on the streets. We see you actually on the streets, and in your bio, you actually have like, here's how you give money to this family that's seeking asylum, here's how you actually do it, and that your art, you're also in conversation with that. You don't just tell their story in a very literal way in order to get things farther, right? So I'm really interested in how the three of you actually think about putting together, seeing the wound, and how you move towards that in all, in the actions of running for office and the actions of that. And I mean, I think you've already started to talk to us about, um, Savitri, about how you're thinking about who is it for and how that works. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd love for you to, to, for three of you to go even farther into, from the identification that something is wrong, <laughs> Um, how then do you move forward into making something happen and, and making something change? I, um, I, did, I did a lot of political theater, um, even like outside of undergrad. I had this, we had this group called Political Subversities that was, um, it was like a sketch, a musical sketch comedy group focused on politics. You could think of it as like The Daily Show. The Daily Show had like um, songs in it and song and dance dance. It was really fun. And um, in, a, in grad school, I really wanted to make something with like actionable items at the end. So similar like, you know, the cat posting the link to how you can help the family. Uh, I did this uh, collaborative piece called Derivatives about um, income inequality, and actually Dave was in it. <laughs> Dave helped out with it. Um, but it was about income inequality, um, both like at a national level, but also like in New Haven. Like New Haven is just so stratified. Like you know, there's like the Yale bubble, and then you can you can literally walk a block, and all of a sudden it's like urban blight. Um, so we had like a mixture of all these interviews from people of varying socioeconomic backgrounds, and it was a, a big mishmash, and it was a lovely project. And at the end, what we did was we collected emails from people to sign them up for this website called Kiva which allows people to like send um, micro loans, like small loans mm -hmm. um, like in like $25 increments to small business owners all around the world. So like $25 may not mean so much for somebody trying to start like a, a restaurant on the Upper East Side, but you know, for a small farmer in the Philippines that wants to buy like the seed for, for their, that, that season, like that, that's a big um, deal to them. And so we sent up a ton of people to like, um, to, to donate that and start that cycle going. Um, yeah, I'll just pause there. Um, I think in, in the United States, we have to reckon with two st streams of, of um, kind of karma, right? The, the Puritanism and the white supremacy, right? And that every wound that becomes visible to us, those things are playing out in them. Uh, the Puritanism causes us to, you know, seek out hypocrisy. Be perfect. We have to be perfect. In order to say anything about climate change, I can't ever take an airplane. You know, this kind of puritanism, which really impacts activism, like on an everyday basis, right? And then, of course, white supremacy, which is, you know, the, the, the minute by minute uh, analysis, self analysis, community analysis structural analysis that we carry with us in this country. It's our, it's our failure and it's our promise, right? We can do this or we can't do this. We're always grappling with that. So, you know, when, when you say the wound, you know, I'm like, I mean, I, I honestly just, I feel like we've been failing for so long and we will fail for so much longer that I don't know how to address the question because the wound is like pulsing with blood, mm. you know, and uh, many of us, I think, working in activism are like, you know, just, tr just trying to stop the bleeding. You know what I mean? N never mind, like, describe it or, or uh, mitigate the pain or, you know, we're just, please, no more blood. You know what I mean? So, you know, I, I, 
you know, I become speechless very quickly when we're talking about that. Of course, there are just a couple little things I think that matter right away, which is to ask the questions like, what are you working on? How can I help you? You know, and that if we start with that position, if we start with those questions, that there's a better chance that we'll, you know, staunch the bleeding a little bit. Well, so you mentioned the, um, the family, the fundraiser thingy in my bio, so I'll, I'll kind of anecdote to how I got there, um, which I hope has some like practical application. So um, I, I also went to uh, Yale School of Trauma um, in New Haven, Connecticut, and before, um, before I got to campus, um, I always do like, where's, where's my gente, where's the people at? So before I was even in New Haven, I did like a quick Google search, learned about Unidad Latina en Acción. I totally agree, Yale is a bubble. I think that's very intentional, um, not, not only on the part of the institution, but you know, people kind of click into a survival mode um, and say, oh no, no, I have to do this. You know, I just have to like put my head down and, and burrow you know, forward in order to get through. And then when I get through, you know, then I can help, you know, then I can do more, then I can kind of like take my life back, et cetera. And I think that's totally a trap. I don't believe in that. That's probably a, a conversation for, uh, for, well, maybe today, but <laughs> not what I'm saying right now. Um, but anyway, I got involved with Unidad Latina en Acción, um, community meetings, um, um, migrant-led organization um, that uh, struggles for migrant rights and workers' rights, because workers' rights are migrants' rights, and migrants' rights are workers' rights. Yay! Um, so I just, you know, I started going to meetings every Monday. Um, when I when I when I could because I too am not you know perfect and sometimes I totally clicked into survival mode and I felt really shitty about it but nevertheless I you know when I could um, I did go and it was through that that I learned of a family in New Haven um, that both of the parents were going to be deported at the same time leaving um, a, an older brother who was just um, a legal adult um, to take care of his minor brother. Um, and so through Unidad Latina en Acción and through um, organizers in New Haven, there was a, a, an act of civil disobedience um, in front of ICE headquarters in, in Hartford, um, where we sat in front of the doors, 36 of us, um, comprised of Yale student, you know, students within the area, professors, religious leaders, um, just concerned community members. Um, we got arrested, um, spent time in jail, um, and then uh, when we were released, we were released into the news that the family was going to be stayed to, uh, there, there was a stay of deportation, which means that that um, order of deportation was, was blocked and the case was going to be reopened and therefore reconsidered. And so that was, that was amazing and a proof of the fact that direct action works. So I don't wanna hear about how we don't know what to do <laughs> because that shit works. Um, it was also through Unidad Latina en Acción that after I, after I graduated um, and was kind of figuring out what I wanted to do, um, a community member um, posted about um, this group called New Sanctuary Coalition based here in NYC that was um, starting to get together a sanctuary caravan to go down to the border, a show of people in solidarity um, to support the migrant community, the, the caravan, um, that was uh, about a year ago. Um, so I started to get involved in that. I went to the border, um, spent two weeks, um, which is, I mean, time and also like minuscule, um, uh, working like directly with people. Um, and it was through that that I met a family. Um, and I um, did not do what we had been told to do, which was not give out your personal information. I gave out my personal information like it was Tic Tacs and I was on RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, and we stayed in, I mean, I met, I met this family um, on December 29th um, and they crossed the border the next day and I'm telling you it was, I've never bonded with human beings that profoundly and that quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, when I left Tijuana, I'm very clear that I left a, 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 a really, like, intense, ever-changing, by-the-minute situation, and also I did not fully leave it because my phone was blowing up with people asking for help, etc. cetera. Um, and so when I got the call um, from someone in detention um, asking if I could sponsor them, 
Um, I, I said yes. Um, I felt like I had to follow through, and I've, I've maintained contact with this family. I mean, very, <laughs> more than contact, very close um, relationship with this family. And so while I've, you know, um, kind of not um, remained a, a fully active participant in New Sanctuary Coalition, and I'm so out of the loop, uh, you know, uh, anyone who's not there, 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 like boots on the ground is like <laughs> out of the loop. Um, you know, again, this one-to-one -one relationship, it's like, this, what is the smallest, most hyper-local thing that I can do, which is be in close relationship to these, you know, three human beings. So yes, when the opportunity to, came, to come here and talk came up and I was asked for my bio, my bio, you know, me personally, my bio is not my bio, my bio is a platform for these, you know, people and it's, so again, I know I just like monologued, but it's how each of these really close, like really small steps, you know, meeting people um, and getting to know people and getting to know their needs, not what I thought their needs were, but what they told me their needs were, and then following through on that and keeping close contact and instead of going big, you know, actually getting really small and really specific. Thank you, I mean, we always think about artists as expressors and like, thank you for reframing that into like, how deeply can we listen? And I feel like that's so much a part. I mean, you're about to, you, you were just confirmed as um, being a Brooklyn Democratic Socialist of America. So for the, for the upcoming election, will you talk about that in terms of what, you're, what you think about and how you think about listening for change? <coughs> Um, that's, a, that's a great question because it's, it's fun. so yes I am I'm running for office again I'm running for state senate um, in Brooklyn and when I was running last time for city council it's it's funny people would say wow how, how did you you seem so charismatic when you're talking to people and like how did you how did you do that and I was like well it's just I mean it's, it's listening it's it's uh, it's 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 acting training acting is listening that's how it is it's, it transfers over and like you know the the, the hundreds and you know, the thousands of doors I knocked on to talk to people and just like hear their problems um, really <laughs> I don't know, it really, it, it changed me, but it also like, I mean, I guess it's something that, you know, many politicians don't do. There's this notion of listening that I guess that's, as artists, like we're just more in tune with doing. And um, it actually woke me up to like a sense of like really systemic problems too. And I know like just even thinking about housing, like one thing that would come up over and over and over again with people like talking about their issues with their landlord or their, their rents and like always the story seemed like when it was coming from them that they seemed like it was their own personal struggle and they were like just their own little silo. Um, and a part of my campaign last time and that'll be this campaign this time is waking people up and letting people know that it's it's not just them even though it may feel like it's just them versus the landlord. Like um, no, it's these are systemic things and you know, have you checked and have you seen that you know, a lot of other people in your in your building um, are also suffering from this, or a lot of other people in the buildings owned by this this massive landlord company are suffering from this. Um, like you're not alone, and like that's um that's something that we do. I can do so we do as politicians, we do as artists, is bring people together. And like I think the you know the person that said the pronoun was we earlier. It's, it's I mean that's that's part of it. I mean like you know when we're in like collective struggle together that's that's what we need to overcome um gentrification um, racism sexism like these huge like institutional systems of oppression um we cannot fight them alone and if we are going to work together yes we need to be listening to each other and it's um very important even just thinking knowing as a politician one thing that i also um um learned from my last run was um, the importance of like not getting set on an agenda of what I wanted to say, and that's close to what Kat was saying about like really like hearing not what I wanted, what I thought they needed, but like what I what they just needed at the moment. Because I remember this this one exchange really changed my, per my perception with this woman in a laundromat. We were just talking, and I was talking about the campaign and like talking to her about her um, experience, and she was talking about her fear of getting. Um, evicted and I like and I tried to tie it into like a macro thing of like you know um like talking about you know and telling her like you know there's this, this is massive like real estate lobby and landlord lobby that donates so much money to upstate politicians to get laws passed that are um in favor of landlords and, and building owners and people who own just you know millions or billions in property and 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 go against laws that are for working people and for tenants and she like um everything just went through one ear and out the other for her because she like heard me speak and then just said so I still think I might be getting evicted. Um, and that was very, I mean, that was very eye-opening for me because um, she had a very immediate need um, that needed to be addressed. 
so I don't know. I think that just moving forward, like you know, there is like a lot of a lot of listening that needs to be getting done as we're going to be in like deeper conversation with each other. Um, yeah. And and you uh, listen and and then sing. <laughs> Like what a beautiful transference, you know, and you gather, I love what you say about gathering people to do that and that action in the streets. Can you talk more about that? Sure, I mean, uh, sometimes I think that the, like we, we've been talking and, and we could have this conversation quite independent of talking about the arts or creativity, right? We could have the conversation and never address where it meets our creative practice and it would be, just as compelling and interesting a conversation. I think, personally, it's very, very difficult to talk about both at once mm -hmm. and to do both at once. You know, obviously they impact each other and those, those uh, rivers and currents come back and forth because that's life, right? But, you know, this idea, this sort of invented idea of the artivist or the, you know, art as a social practice. I mean, for me, I feel it's a little bit, yeah, it's a little projected. It's a little bit bullshit. It's a little bit like, really, are you sure? Because I think what we're doing is just plain old, like, good works, right? Like, is it creative? Is it artistic? I mean, sometimes it is, okay? So singing, yeah. I mean, we have a community of singers, uh, and we sing, and I, I've come to realize that we sing because we have to. We sing because it's the thing that keeps us being activists for 20 years. It allows us to, it makes it sustainable because it's a pleasure. Is it super creative? Is it, uh, I don't know anymore. You know, I'm not so sure. I, I know there are times when our work is on a kind of like a vanguard of sort of invention, like going down to the pit at ground zero and, and singing the First Amendment with, you know, Uzis all around us. Uh, you know, singing as you're being arrested, like staging actions in giant institutions and, and casting police in your show and then have, watching them do exactly what you said they would do. You know, those things, yes, it's very creative and it does feel like an artistic practice. But in the end, like when I look at the life of being an activist, the, the, the artist part is like, I'm an artist, I'm creative, it's what I like to do, I make things, given the chance, I will make things. But finally, the activism is about um, caring. You know, and I, I don't know, I feel like the projection of the, the two together is becoming really problematic. It's becoming a career, it's becoming an industry, it's, and I like New Orleans is a great example. After Katrina, and why it's problematic, you know, after Katrina, ph philanthropists from around the world said like, oh, here's a perfect laboratory for us to do all this work. Let's send all this money down, we'll do all this creative, amazing social practice in New Orleans. And what it seems like it led to was a lot of not listening, a lot of kind of like spaceships landing with this sort of artistic idea of how to address the problem of New Orleans and the problem of climate change and the problem of this and that. And, and the justice kind of bled out of it and it was someone's job all of a sudden, you know? And I, so I think, you know, I think we have to be careful about how we personally engage with it and say like what we call it, you know, like if, if I go, after Hurricane Sandy and I like deliver food, is that activism or is that service? Is that, a, is that an art project? I don't think so. That's like an old person who needs food. Mm -hmm. Do I need that to be an art project? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, you know, but, but so I think we have to be really hard on ourselves, you know, as artists to say like, maybe it's okay if it's not, that's not an art project. That's just delivering food to someone who can't go up and down the damn stairs. So I want to be careful about it. But then I want to say like, it is incredible to go with a group of allies and like a, an affinity group on the street and sing music that you've worked on and sing songs that you've developed over years that came from like real experiences with, you know, Ravi from New Sanctuary Coalition, we met him the day he came out of detention in 2009 and we sang to him on the street. And I have to tell you, for all of us, it was like uh, the sky opening and you don't ever turn your back on that relationship you make. When you walked that family across the border, you know, you, that's real in your life, right? Your legs are built of that now, right? And, and your work will reflect that no matter what, if you address it explicitly or not. But um, the singing, it, it adds up. It's good. I mean, 
we should all sing. You should, everyone here should sing. It makes you feel better. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't go to Tijuana as an artist, you know, per se. I went as myself, you know, a community member um, who recognized that, you know, these folks, by wanting to be a part of the community, are already a part of the community. And I think that when we, when we get hung up on and we let, you know, the art, whatever, lead, that, Im that impulse mm -hmm. um, lead, that's when it becomes a kind of excursion, right? That's when it becomes, um, you know, uh, a kind of like uh, tour of, you know, this place and this problem and these people and this problem and my common denominator ability, you know, rather than uh, really listening and hearing um, and, and it's like in the, t I know I keep saying this, but it's so, you know, so true. It's in the like tiny, you know, minutia, you know, bullshit, like everyday, everyday needs, you know, resistance isn't always like the thing that's gonna make the front page, the thing that like, you know, brings glory, right? Um, resistance um, and disruption often look like, you know, um, not meeting quota, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, uh, being intentionally, like, taking your time, you know, healing yourself. I mean, and, and again, like, for whatever, however you are in relationship to the issue at hand is going to um, really shape, I think, the limits um, of one's ability to, you know, lead. I think that people that are most, and this is not an original thought, but folks, I subscribe to the idea that folks who are closest to the issue should be the ones to lead, and we should be the ones listening. And you know, if we can be like on the, you know, uh, taking some of that, that say, taking some of the blows, um, let's do that. If we can be the ones that are, you know, raising money, donating money, if we have a space that we can offer, you know, et cetera. But it's about really listening to the immediate need. And in order to hear that immediate need, you have to be in community. There's, there's no other way than to get to know the people around you so that it doesn't become an issue, so that it doesn't become, you know, the topic of a conversation at, you know, at a university um, that is disengaged. It's so easy to do. And I can say, like, I'm, I'm documented. My dad is not a citizen. He's a resident. Um, and so much of what I know is, is, is from becoming close friends and co-conspirators with people who are, you know, centri centered <laughs> in the thing that we're trying to undo. Absolutely, not art becomes an, an imperialist columnist act, yeah. you know, it, like so quickly and so easily. Um, I want to make sure that folks have time to ask questions if they would like of, of, of folks up here. Does anybody, yeah. Oh, here, let me give you a microphone so we can capture the okay. recording for people who are watching. Oh, very interesting. I appreciate where you're coming from. I'm a documentary filmmaker. I've filmed uh, Reverend Billy and Savitri and the Stop Shopping Acquire since the early 2000s, uh, among others. Uh, and, and one of the things uh, uh, you mentioned about 9-11 being a changing factor, I, I was sitting on my terrace on the 20th floor watching the uh, tower, one tower, and then the next tower, and I'm thinking to myself, as I was in, involved with the uh, New York City school system helping develop their project arts system, and I said, wow, we're going to have thousands of kids who are going to be suffering from PTSD, and the parents are going to be, and then all of a sudden I realized, how do you make sense out of things that don't make sense? And I said, well, art makes sense out of things that don't make sense. And then I thought to myself, well, what is damage? You know, in, and I, I thought, well, maybe it's the imagination that's damaged. And maybe the value of art is caring for our imagination, mm -hmm. both as individuals and as a collective society. And about the power of one person to make a difference. And we can all make that difference. Yeah. And you are making that difference. How do we encourage others to do that? as individuals. Any thoughts? I mean, I, 
I'm a big fan of just literally just telling people, well, one, after, after I ran for office the first time, I was like, well, everyone should do this. Everyone should run for office. <laughs> um, which I still, I mean, that's, it's an experience that I, every, or in some form that everyone should take the, should take on the experience of running for something, some kind of position. I don't, it doesn't have to be like an elected, you know, in, in government, but you know, you're running a school board, if you know, you live in a place with school boards, or if you're in a union, a place within your union, um, so on and so forth. But if not that, I mean, I'm also a big fan of just telling people just to get involved in campaigns, and um, like not necessarily an electoral campaign, it doesn't need to be for a person, but there's always like, you know, a ton of like, issue-based campaigns that are going on at any time, like whether it's an issue for housing justice or, or um, healthcare justice or racial justice or just, um, there's something so activating about working on a campaign, like the timetables um, that you have to work on, learning how to just like talk to people um, about their issues and like, you know, act, you know, activate them into like, you know, fighting for something. And it's um, something that's really enriching too. To be, to, to be fighting f like for something and fighting for something specific and, and knowing there's a very clear goal and like, oh my gosh, okay, so if we can all get together, we can make this many phone calls and, collect, and, and, and um, convince this many politicians. It's, it's something that I think is really exciting for people. Um, and, just, and, and it really changes your, it makes you feel very um, empowered, I think. Um, and also I think it's, it just, it ends up being a, like a snowball effect. Like once you do more, you just want to do even more and, and more and more and more and more and more. So I, those are my two things. Uh, I'll say something. I'm not going to be somebody who rails against this because I think this is an amazing tool. Um, I know that there's so you know there's a there's absolutely a critique. You know, people are so you know glued to their phones, and you know the the kind of um, showing up becomes virtual, and it's you know like you know hacktivism or whatever. Um, I think this is an incredible tool. Um, you know, when it's about connecting and getting the invitation out there, and I think showing up is the most important part. So when you have, you know, if you, if you are starting to get involved, how do you get someone to go to like a dinner you want to go to or try a new restaurant or like go to an event that you're going to, you, you have a relationship with them and you invite them and you like let it be known why you want to go and why you think, you know, it would be cool if they went to. And it's about the one-to-one -one personal intimate relationship. It's hard you know, um, to just kind of put something out there. I mean, even, even if generally broadly, you know, I'm posting something online, I mean, people are gonna look at it, oh, they have a relationship to me, I have a relationship to them, and so, you know, I think putting, putting the invitation out there, however that form, you know, whether it's a text or a tweet, or whatever, is important, um, and following through is also, you know, um, something that we should all do so it's not just words but uh and, and again it's not the thing that's always going to be visible mm -hmm. um it's going to be the invisible thing but like somebody sees you doing it you know like even if it's not broadcast um somebody you know in your close circle or whatever sees you doing it um you get them involved and then the more that they become involved the more that you learn the more that you learn how to like again follow through show up bring more people into the circle and I think also uh, we all have to look in our own lives where we can do it, right? Like some of us are in institutions where we can't make those, we can't cross those borders in those <coughs> institutions or at our job in particular ways or, you know, say in, in, your, in your personal relationship, right? Like, you know, you can't necessarily defend your pussy in a particular way in your relationship or I'm just, I, I mean, I'm saying that all of us have like a border that we can cross somewhere. Right, and it's about looking for it and being willing to like uh, do it. And, and and I think that sounds so simple. It's just like just go do that, but actually, it's not simple at all because we don't realize how prescribed our behavior is now. We don't realize how conformist we've become. We don't realize the way the monoculture has come down into every cell in our body, and that we're all behaving in very narrow ways, right? And that if in my relationship I decide to act out or to defend myself, or if in my uh, institution I decide to stand up and you know, defend my whole cohort or you know, any number of things. But, but I think the, the key now is to choose one and do it instead of like, hmm. And so I think we can encourage our friends and our communities and like have that radiant sphere come from ourselves, right? Like it, it glows outward and we can do that. But I think it's just as much like, you know, I'm also at this place where I think, you know what, I am not here to convince any of you to be more activist. Like if the conditions that you are in have not convinced you, 
I don't know what the fuck will, honestly. And I mean that in like the best way, but like, am I gonna do that? Am I that powerful? You know, are we gonna do that? It's not up to us, it's up to everyone. And so I think we have to be harder on each other too. Like invite each other, but be much harder on each other and make that demand of each other and not like, oh, you're really, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, t it's tough right now to get people to uh, cross that line. But it's happening. Yeah, I see the illness of America as being couch in apathy and comfort. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that it's so easy to be there. And so most of my work happens in China. And one of my dear friends, Jian Yi, you know, he did not sign <clears throat> the human rights declaration that put Liu Xiaobo in jail. And that when he won the Nobel uh, Peace Prize uh, for it, he was not able to attend because he was still in jail and his wife, Liu Xia, was ho in house arrest for how many years? Every single person who signed that mm -hmm. and their families were jailed or in house arrest or their careers completely dissipated. Yeah. He did not sign and to this day he wonders if he should but he also knows that he's able to have a child mm -hmm. and he's able to do all the work he's able to do because he did not sign. And that kind, like when I'm talking to him, that kind of urgency, that kind of understanding of what things cost, yeah, sure. and that deep connection to all of that is, I feel, a place where in the American dream, mm -hmm. we have lost. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm. Any other thoughts or questions? Well, I'm feeling a lot of grief, actually. Yeah. Would you a lot of grief. The, uh, you know, as a artist and a theater person, as a filmmaker, um, I've been involved in uh, everything since mid-50s in my small way or, you know, all kinds of stuff. And um, I find myself in the last year or two working with uh, Extension Rebellion and other climate change groups, including Fridays for Future last week, helping as I can, doing what I can in there. And I'm feeling two really strong things. One is that my community, artists of the left, uh, political people, I find enormous timidity. I find uh, kind of business as usual, um, even among those that I love. Uh, we are, I mean, what we're facing is the end of life on earth. I don't have to say that to anybody here. Mm -hmm. We all know. And the part of it is that the poorest and the blackest of people will suffer, but everyone's going to suffer. Everyone, including this, all the species. And there's just no sense that that's what, where we're at. Uh, oh, you know, the four million kids and their supporters Fantastic. I don't hear it talked about in groups like this. I don't hear us understanding that they don't have an agenda. They don't, you know, they don't know what they're doing. They're just walking out. I talk with them. They're smart. Um, but I don't feel the connection between that impulse on one hand, which is inspiring and great. The catastrophe that we're in the midst of, and my fellow intellectual, artist, political people, I don't feel connection at all. It's like there's no, you know, I go out on the street and I play Trump and I do that, and I go out and I play cops and I do my thing. I've done that for 50 years and it <laughs> feels good. I love it, yeah, it feels good. Is that enough? No. We need something else to, 
to bring out, we've got to shut it down. I, obviously, there's going to have to be four million people who go out and say, we're not going home. The Pentagon is not going to work. The, you know, Parliament is not going to... That's, we all know politically, unless we shut it down, it will shut down. And I think as artists and intellectuals, I'm struggling to try to figure out, as one of us, I'm trying to figure out what to do. And I, I was in the living theater, bread and puppet. I, we, all, we all did all that. But let me just right? interrupt you to say one thing, which Thank is remember you. that you know nothing. Remember that none of us really know anything. All we have is our very narrow historical view that always favored a few people anyway and is totally suspect. So remember that and know that change is dynamic and that things happen in dynamic ways, that you, whoever you are and whatever life you've had, can't possibly imagine or know. Can't possibly imagine or know what? The dynamic change that may or may not come. Yeah, but if we can't figure it out, we're in deep trouble. You've never been able to figure it out before. You know, humans- We stopped the war. Well, Civil rights succeeded. Women got the right to vote. India became an independent country. There are victories. Where is this? What is this strategy? I don't hear shit about that from us. I am. Um, from me. I, I, excuse me. This is not an accusation. I, I don't know. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't I love. No, I love that. I love that comment. I love that frustration because I. I sympathize with this notion of like, you know, you go out and you do something in the street, um, a performance piece, and that's not enough. And then I understand the frustration because it seems like four million people marched and then that also wasn't enough. And, I, um, and um, if we were to talk about it, would that be enough? And so what is it going to take? <laughs> but, um, uh, I, I remember speaking to another group of artists um, a couple years ago when I was running and I, and I just said like one of the most beautiful things. I love about artists that were such passionate people and um, so like fueled up with like fire that like we just I just find as we shine so brightly that we ignite the people around us and um, I think it's almost like our you know the duty of artists to just you know wake people up um, around them um, I just want to side on something like we none of us know right like we don't know but if you wake enough people up like I think we can make some kind of lasting change. Um, and maybe it's the maybe it's the duty. If maybe if four million people isn't enough, then maybe eight million people is right. Or if that's not maybe then maybe twenty million people is. But maybe the, the step is that we don't stop until we we can't find anyone else around in our, in our local circle that we need to get involved. And yeah, I would say I mean yeah, the planet's burning. So I mean I can speak. I haven't done enough. I don't know if anybody's done enough yet. Um, these things are still really going terribly, and it is very it's very frustrating, and it's very it's very scary, and especially for people that are gonna be here for the next, or alive for the next 50, 60, 70 years in whatever case um, world it's gonna be. And um, I, I, I just, I, I really appreciate that frustration because that's what we need. And we, we do need to, we need to you know, continue to affirm that like until like we start reducing carbon levels in the atmosphere, everything is not enough. Everything we, everything we've done so far is not enough because it's, it's still, the, the climate crisis is still getting worse. I think this is a good example of like the micro versus the macro. Um, and, you know, these struggles are always, you know, concurrent, happening at the same time. Um, progress is not neat. Um, there are, in fact, people who are, are struggling and figuring it out. Um, you know, I think the students who are um, at the forefront, the, the young people who are at the forefront of the climate struggle right now are, as you said, incredibly smart. And they're not just walking out. <laughs> they have you know, a message. Um, you know, I think if there is frustration, if anyone's feeling frustration about, um, and not just you, but folks listening, of like what to do, like no, you know, nothing's happening, whatever, okay, maybe, maybe um, my calling then is not to um, be one of those people who's figuring it out. Um, maybe my calling is to feed people in my community. Again, hyper-local, because some people's existence is their resistance. Right, um, and maybe my work is to facilitate, you know, to, to make things a little bit easier for them and be in community. So I don't think, you know, at the same time that it's incredibly important, yes, to be having, you know, the conversations and doing the things that are at the global level, are, because our liberation, again, not an original thought, but our, our liberation is collective and bound up in each other's. Um, and we also have to trust that people who are, you know, really at the center 
are holding it down and are pushing us forward. And sometimes our job is to get behind them, to fall back and not to become, I'm not saying to become pa passive, or to get paralyzed by you know, our, our frustration or our feeling. Sometimes falling back, again, is listening, is being deep in community, you know, and really, really, really just doing like the minute bullshit that seems like it doesn't make a difference, but does. Because you know, from the folks that I've talked to that were in detention, the things that were most meaningful were letters. It's what you business. said. It's what you said at the very beginning of this. I'm Sonata. So I'm one of the co-creators <laughs> with Hi. <laughs> it's what you said at the very beginning, which is you know making it. We have to do something about this. Makes it about us rather than really looking to what needs to be supported. And I think this, what Greta Thunberg and like all of those kids are doing needs support, and we can continue to support them in the ways that you said with uh, Friday Friday Futures or I forgot the name of the Fridays for Future. Um, but that, that just continuing to believe that there is a continuum and that it's a constant moving forward and this like sense of patience that I think I see in the way that you guys all are talking about the work you're doing and the way that you have patience for each other and for us, um, I think that's a huge part of it. And it's really inspiring to hear that the small things and the de -local, like the localized things and decentralized things actually do make a difference, even if we can't see it in this tiny moment, that it's such a longer experience than what we can imagine. Um, yeah, sorry, I just want to I just piggyback on that. That was great. <laughs> I just want to I just want to plug a campaign real quick, just because I love I love plugging campaigns. But um, if you are in New York, if you're if you're watching and you live in New York, I'm gonna plug the Public Power um, campaign, which is just a campaign to um, build an energy system that's run um, by the public, by the people, as opposed to by a business or a corporation. And like, yes, I'm I'm in the Democratic Socialists of America. I am a socialist. Um, but you don't you don't need to be a socialist to be part of the campaign. You just need to re um, agree that perhaps um, we can move further we can move much more quickly to a system that isn't based on fossil fuels if, we, if, if energy is run by people who don't have a financial interest in, in, in maintaining fossil fuels. Um, if it truly is energy for the people and not um, you know, influenced by you know, whatever can make the most money at that, at that time. Yeah, and I think it's, um, there are things today that anyone here can do. Like New Sanctuary Coalition, you can go join their accompaniment program, their Pro Se Clinic. They need people all the time, especially Spanish Spanish speakers, and um, if you want to go try and stop a, a fracked gas power plant in three weeks' time that's going to come online in about a month's time, please talk to me. We'll probably have many hundreds of people trying to stop that. Um, I mean, there are so many things one can do right, right now, today. Cool. I, can I? I'm going to do it too. Um, <laughs> I sense that we're wrapping Boring. up. Dope. Um, so if you want to get involved, um, there, there are various ways. I mean, these are, these are some that I um, happen to have some level of relationship to. Um, the Asylum Seekers Sponsorship, so sponsorship Project. Ugh. If you Google Asylum Seekers Sponsorship Project, you will get a hit for Asylum Speakers, Seekers Sponsorship Project.org. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a project that comes out of Surge, showing up for racial justice. And um, if you have a space, if you want to find out how you can become a sponsor for somebody, um, uh, if you have a space to offer an, a migrant, um, this is a way to do that. That is, I would say, a kind of high level of commitment. Um, another way to commit is um, you can donate your unused airline miles to Miles for Migrants. That's Miles, the number four, migrants. Super simple. Doesn't cost you literally anything. You can send letters to people in detention via flowers on the inside. Flowers on the inside. And then you can donate funds to the following organizations, Al Otro Lado, which is a group that is based in Tijuana and San Diego, amazing lawyers, um, amazing on the ground work. Unlocal, specific to New York. Make the Road, which has its headquarters in New York and also chapters um, in other parts of the country. Central American Legal Assistance, based in New York, really small you know, operation, really big impact. Catholic Charities um, does incredible work um, with uh, um, an immigration uh, help desk 
um, that is traveling, clothing donation, um, free uh, lawyer services. There's also the Transgender Law Center's Black LGBTQIA plus migrant project. So often um, black folks um, and uh, LGBTQIA plus community um, is, you know, decentered, forgotten, and the impact here is um, huge. Um, and Kids in Need of Defense, KIND, which is an organization that offers pro bono legal services to minor migrants. Um, those are, again, just some of the ways to get involved. Some of them ask for your space, some of them ask for your funds, some of them ask for your time, um, and some of them just ask for you to give a flying fuck. <laughs> and her um, Nobel, Pri Nobel Prize uh, acceptance speech, Wysawa Zaborska, who is a Polish poet and Holocaust survivor, um, talks about how people think that artists have a monopoly on inspiration. And she dismantles that. She says, everyone has access to inspiration, a lawyer, a doctor, a janitor, as long as they do what they do with attention and love. Mm -hmm. And how beautiful that we can be inspired by all of those um, organizations and, and people that you mentioned, even when we do know nothing, that we can be inspired by all of those incredible people um, in order to take action in some way. Uh, thank you so much. Thank, thank you so you. much for being here. Yes, and thank you guys. And thank you all for coming. Feel free to continue the conversation outside. Sanaz is going to say a brief thing about the next event um, before we wrap. Hi. Um, I'm just going to stand here. So, I'm uh, so at 7 o'clock tonight, we're doing a, um, there's this new initiative, and we don't really know quite what it is yet, but uh, it's called Public Parks Project, and this is the first assembly. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an attempt to um, find a way to create discourse uh, amongst people. <laughs> I'm just being really general because I don't have my speech with me right now. Um, but it's to find uh, ways of getting citizens together um, in the all 140 parks in the New York City community um, sometime in the spring. Uh, but we don't really know what we're doing, and so we are having this first assembly tonight at uh, 7 o'clock here. There are refreshments and snacks provided, um, so please join us as we figure out. Uh, we, we're really just, it's really just a time for us to um, ask questions, because uh, we don't have any answers. Um, and it would be wonderful to see you there, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, pray Woo